I'm in charge of adult programs at the Rogers Memorial Library. We're very happy to have so many of you here today with us. Before we get started, I wanted to uh, thank the League of Women Voters, of course, who have been active participants with us here um, today. And I'd also like to thank three libraries, the Hampton Bays Library, the John Germain Library, and the Port Jefferson Library, as well as the Southampton History Museum for co-sponsoring this event. I wanna to mention to those of you who weren't listening in a few minutes ago, that we will wait until the end of, of uh, Martha Potter's talk to have a Q&A session. And you are invited to raise, use the raise your hand feature, which you can find if you click on the participants button uh, of your, the, at the bottom of your screen so that we'll know that you have a question and then we will unmute you. We've also asked, uh, we're gonna ask you if you can refrain from using the chat function <laughs> during Martha's talk, that would be wonderful because it won't be a distraction for her then. So back to the reason that we're here. We've known Martha Potter for quite a while. She gave an excellent talk at the library a couple of years ago about the constitution. So when we wanted to think about um, having this particular talk, we asked Martha and Martha stepped up to the plate. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, as some of you know, her career is not um, being a, a public speaker, but it's being a teacher. So I'll tell you a couple of things about her. She was originally from uh, Sag Harbor, uh, from Brooklyn rather, and about 35 years ago, she moved to Sag Harbor. Um, after 33 years, actually, she, no, she moved to Sag Harbor about 15 years ago after teaching for 33 years, eight, kids ages uh, from two to 18 year olds. And the last 15 years of that, she was an AP uh, history teacher in high school. Uh, she worked part-time at the John Germain Library for a number of years as their program coordinator. She taught ESL, and she has currently been teaching a course to help immigrants pass their naturalization tests. That is on hold for the moment. Martha's field of expertise is American history, particularly the history of the Constitution and the struggles to gain rights in the U.S. She reports that it was a privilege as a teen to work for civil rights as a member of Corps and to attend the March on Washington in 1963. Martha is a member of the League of Women Voters of the Hamptons and was on the board of the Sag Harbor His History Historical Society for many years. We are so grateful to have her in our community, Martha. So you can just pretend we're all clapping because thank you for being here. We're gonna turn it over to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think, can you all see my screen share? Shake your heads if I see you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, welcome. I'm a bit nervous, but we'll get through this. <laughs> okay, I would like to thank Penny and the Rogers Memorial Library for inviting me today, and the League of Women Voters and the Southampton Historical Society, which were the first sponsors. I'd like to thank the other libraries who joined in. It is a volatile time in United States history, and we can, we can make our voices heard by casting our ballots. The fight for universal suffrage dates to the revolution and is still imperative. The talk will begin with a general overview of suffrage in America, and then discuss the fight for women's suffrage, black suffrage, and Native American suffrage. Oh dear. <laughs> I'm having tech, oh there, no, there we go, okay. A technical difficulties, which I'm not used to. The idea of one person, one vote is essential to the concept of universal suffrage. It is 150 years since the passage of the 15th amendment, giving black men the right to vote. 
and a hundred years since the passage of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Native Americans are still seeing barriers to complete enfranchisement. When Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, slaves, women, the poor, and Native Americans were excluded from that equality. When Abraham Lincoln stated in the Gettysburg Address, this nation under God shall have new, a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. In the Gettysburg Address, the definition of who was considered the people was not clear. When the majority of the Supreme Court tried to enforce the idea of universal suffrage by deciding that state elections must adhere to the one person, one vote principle in Gray versus Sanders, 1963, many Blacks and Native Americans were still excluded. Chief Justice Earl Warren stated, all who participate in the election are to have an equal vote, whatever their race, sex, whatever their occupation, their income, wherever their home may be in the geographic unit. Associate Justice William O. Douglas stated, the concept of political equality from the Declaration of Independence to the Gettysburg Address to the 15th, 17th, and 19th Amendments can mean only one thing, one person, one vote. Yet a country where all the people would have a voice in the government was still far in the future. In Article 1, Section 4 of the United States Constitution, individual states retain the right to regulate their own voting laws for the House of Representatives and the Senate. State law restricted voting to law-owning men 21 and older. Article 2, Section 1 sets up the Electoral College for presidential elections. Today, there are 538 electors equal to senators and representatives from all the states and Washington, D.C. The Supreme Court unanimously decided on July 7, 2020, this year, that states may require members of the Electoral College to vote for the president, must require members of the Electoral College to vote for the presidential candidate they promised to support, eliminating rogue electors. There are always a few each year. Some states have linked the national popular vote to the electoral votes. It has been enacted in 16 jurisdictions, representing 196 electoral votes. 270 votes would make a majority. Note, in the election of 1840, 1824, 1876, 1888, 2000, and 2016, the winner of the popular vote for president was not elected. Our Constitution was ratified in 1787. In 1865, all states eliminated property requirements. North Carolina was the last state to eliminate property requirements. In 1870, the 15th Amendment made it illegal to deny the right to vote based on race. In 1913, the 17th Amendment allowed for the direct election of senators by the people. They used to be elected by the state legislatures. In 1920, the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote. Its 100th anniversary was yesterday. In 1961, the 23rd Amendment allowed citizens of Washington, D.C. to vote for president. And now there's a bill before the House of Representatives to make Washington, D.C. a state. We'll see what happens. In 1964, the 23rd Amendment ended poll tax, which was used by states to restrict voting. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed 
forbidding states from passing acts that discriminate. The federal observers were used to enforce this. And in 1971, the 26th Amendment lowered voting age to 18. The fight for women's equality started early in our history. Abigail Adams wrote a letter to John Adams in 1776. I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put unlimited power in the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If, if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment the rebellion and will hold ourselves bound, would not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Abigail Adams, letter to John Adams, March 31st, 1776. It took over a hundred years for her words to be heard. In July of 1848, women gathered to express their hopes for equality. 300 people attended the Women's Rights Convention, presided over by James Mott, Lucretia Mott's husband. Women were not allowed to preside over public meetings. The convention declared, the convention produced the Declaration of Sentiments which was read by Elizabeth Cady Stanton on July 20th, 1848, signed by 68 women and 32 men. It was modeled after the Declaration of Independence. The usurper is he and not the king. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are equal, are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these rights, it is the right of those who suffer from it to refuse allegiance to it and to insist upon the institution of a new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Some women were not in favor of the right to vote, which was the ninth resolution. Lucretia Mott was against it. The ninth resolution declared it is the duty of the women of this country to secure themselves their sacred right to elective franchise. Women began to organize toward greater rights. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony formed the National Women's Suffrage Association in reaction to the 15th Amendment to work for votes for women and address other issues as divorce and equal pay. Henry Blackwell, Blackwell, Julia Ward Howe, and Lucy Stone supported the 15th Amendment and formed the American Women's Suffrage Association, working exclusively to get all women the right to vote. Wyoming was the first state to allow women to vote in 1869. On September 6, 1870, Louisa Ann Gardner Swain was the first woman to cast her ballot in a general election in Laramie, Wyoming. Utah followed in 1870 and Idaho in 1896. On February 18, 1890, the two organizations merged to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Elizabeth Patty Stanton was president, excuse me, Susan B. Anthony was vice president. After the passage of the 15th Amendment, Anthony, who was anti-slavery, 
focused her actions only on the enfranchisement of white women. Anthony attempted to vote based on her rights as a citizen under the 14th Amendment in 1872 and was arrested for doing so. Webster's Dictionary defines a citizen as someone entitled to vote. She therefore believed she was entitled to vote. She was granted a pardon yesterday by President Trump. In Minor versus Happersett, 1875, the Supreme Court ruled that women did not have the right to vote under the 14th Amendment. The fact that women are citizens does not give them the right to vote. Women property owners in the late 1860s and 70s held a tax rebellion, no vote, no taxes, echoing the revolutionary cry, no taxation without representation. Working women also organized for the right to vote. James Adam and Florence Adams and Florence Kelly of Hull House in New York helped to form the Women's Trade Union League in 1903, organizing women into trade unions and recruiting working class women into the suffrage movement. The core membership of the Trade Union League compromised, comprised of, excuse me, 20,000 factory, laundry, and garment workers from the Lower East Side of New York City. No one needs all the power of the fullest citizenship more urgently than the wage earning woman, said Florence Kelly in 1898. Lucy Stone started the Women's Journal in 1870. It was considered the voice of the women's movement. It was purchased by Carrie Chapman Catt in 1917 and served as the official publication of the National American Women's Suffrage Association until 1920, when the organization became the League of Women Voters. It was published until 1931. The League was officially found in Chicago in 1920, just six months before the 19th Amendment was ratified and women won the right to vote. For it was formed by suffragists of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Lee began as a mighty political experiment designed to help 20 million women carry out their new responsibilities as voters. Between 1913 and 1920, women intensified the fight for suffrage. Inez Milholland Bosevain led a march on March 30th, March 3rd, 1913. The suffrage, she led the suffrage parade on horseback before Wilson's inauguration. In 1916, before she died, she states, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? This became a rally cry of the suffrage movement. Over 5,000 women marched with 20 floats and nine bands and 100 women had to be hospitalized for injuries. States lined up. Some women from the Southern and Eastern states did not want to march with the colored women. Ida B. Wells Barnett and Mary Church Terrell founded the National Association of Colored Women and helped form the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People. These organizations worked, worked to assure Black women were not forgotten in the fight for women's suffrage. Mary Church Terrell even joined the Silent Sentinels to picket Woodrow Wilson's White House. Alice Paul was a radical women's rights activist. She was influenced by Emmeline Pankhurst's Pankhurst's more aggressive movement in England. She returned from England to the United States with Lucy Burns and founded the Congressional Union 
for women's suffrage, later known as the National Women's Party, as a branch of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Her goal was to pressure Wilson to support women's suffrage. They carried petitions to Congress. In 1950, they organized the suffrage booth at the Panama Pacific Exhibit in San Francisco. In 1917, they organized the silent sentinels who you see on the screen to picket Wilson's White House. Three women made a cross country trip with a petition of 500,000 signatures to abandon suffrage. As the picketing continued, several picketers were arrested. Paul and others were arrested and jailed for obstructing traffic. The women who were arrested were sent to Okaquane Workhouse. Those arrested went on a hunger strike. And some were force fed milk and mush through a tube. Their picket sign showed the contrast between Wilson's view of democracy and his stand against women's rights. Well, he tells us to fight for liberty abroad, tell him to make America free for democracy. Before he asked the mothers of America to throw their sons to the support of democracy in Europe. Finally, Wilson supported the amendment as a war measure. The 19th Amendment was ratified on August 18, 1920. Tennessee was the last state to ratify. And then everybody's have heard of Harry Byrne today. Harry Byrne changed his vote after receiving a letter from his mother asking him to vote for suffrage. Warren Harding in 1921 and Calvin Coolidge in 1923 were the first presidents elected with a sizable number of women's votes. In 1973, Congressman Bella Absent declared August 26 was Women's Equality Day, celebrating the day that Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby certified the 19th Amendment. After the 19th Amendment was passed, Paul wrote the Equal Rights Amendment in 1922 to guarantee equal rights for women and prohibit discrimination based on sex. It passed both houses in 1972, 50 years later. Equal equality of rights under law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. The deadline for ratification was 1979, extended to 1982. After many years, it has returned to state ballots. Nevada ratified the amendment in 2017, and Illinois ratified it in 2018. Both houses of the Virginia Re legislature voted to pass the amendment in January of this year, making it the crucial 38th state needed to pass the amendment. In this long process, five states have voted to withdraw their ratification. Congress would have to move, remove the deadline to make these votes valid, and the courts need to decide whether the states have the power to rescind their ratification. While well, women began their fight for suffrage, Black men and women were still slaves. The Reconstruction period began between 1865 as the Civil War ended and slaves were free. Frederick Douglass stated, slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. The 14th Amendment gave anyone born in the United States citizenship. And the 15th Amendment stated that citizens' right to vote could not be denied by race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The Reconstruction period after the Civil War lasted from 1865 to 1877. Black men voted and held public office. The Reconstruction Act of 1867 established five military districts 
to enforce the amendment. More than 1,500 black men held public office in the South. 16 black Americans served in Congress and hundreds served in state legislatures and held local offices. Hiram Rhodes Revels was the first African American in the United States Congress. In 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes, a Republican, and Samuel Tilden, a Democrat, backed by Southern Democrats, ran for the presidency. Neither candidate had majority of the electoral votes. Votes from South Carolina, Florida, Louisiana were, dis were disputed. Congress set up a bipartisan electoral commission to decide the election. An agreement was reached. Southern Democrats agreed not to block the Hayes election if the federal government withdrew its troops from the South. Thus began the Jim Crow era. The Jim Crow era lasted from 1877 to 1965 and far beyond. 130,000 Blacks in Alabama registered to vote in 1877. In 1896, only 1,342 registered to vote. In 1867, 66.9% of Blacks registered to vote in Mississippi. In 1955, only 4.3% registered. One person, one vote by Carol Anderson. Southern states created barriers to voting. These included grandfather clauses, poll tax, and literacy tests. The grandfather clauses stated you could only vote if your grandfather could vote. Black men, grandfathers were slaves. Many states passed laws requiring a poll tax must be paid before one could vote. The poll tax was cumulative for every year the payment was due and voters were required to keep receipts to prove they had paid. Poll tax was not outlawed till 1964 with the passage of the 24th Amendment to the Constitution. Literacy tests were required in many states. In early 1940s, after she turned legal voting age, Rosanelle Eaton, a black woman, traveled by mule wagon to register to vote at Franklin County Courthouse. But she found herself confronted by three white men who tried to stop her. They demanded that she recite the preamble to the United States Constitution. How many of you can do that? A common literacy test used to discourage, block, and turn away black people from voting. Eaton, unshaken, recited the entire thing. The men conceded and allowed her to register, making Eaton one of the first black voters in North Carolina since Reconstruction, NPR, December 12, 1988. Private primaries. The Southern Democrats controlled the South until the 1960s or beyond. Whoever won the Democratic primary would win the general election the Democratic primaries were whites only. The Supreme Court ruled in Smith v. Allwright, 1944, against a Texas law that allowed private primaries, stating it was unconstitutional for the state to delegate its authority over elections to parties in order to allow discrimination to be practiced. This ruling affected all states and where the, where the party held white primaries. In nine, August 1963, thousands marched to Washington to demand civil rights for all. Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Personal anecdote, I was 16 and working in a summer camp. The 
He left on a bus to Washington, along with hundreds of thousands of others. I was standing next to the reflecting pool in, the, in front of the Lincoln Memorial when Martin Luther King Jr. spoke. I also heard John Lewis, who died in July, inspire the crowd with these words. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want our freedom now. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. How long can we be patient? This was 1963. The Children's Crusade was organized in 1963 to demand equal rights. Today, several of the Black Lives Matters demonstrations are organized by youth. On May 2nd, 1963, Reverend James Luther Avell organized middle and high school students to skip class and assemble at the 16th Street Baptist Church to march to downtown Birmingham, Alabama to demand equal rights. As they approached police lines, hundreds were arrested and carried off to jail in paddy wagons. Police dogs and fire hoses were used to stop the children. Thousands of children continued to march despite the violence. On September 15, 1963, the church was bombed by white supremacists and four young girls, ages 11 to 14, were killed. In the summer of 1964, over 700 volunteers rode buses to Mississippi to protect the rights of blacks who tried to vote. They were met by violent resistance from the Ku Klux Klan. While well, 17,000 Black Mississippians attempted to register to vote that summer, only 1,200 were successful. Three civil rights volunteers, James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman, were killed while participating in Freedom Summer registration in Meridian, Mississippi. John Dower, Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, from 1960 to 1967, helped investigate and prosecute crimes related to these killings. He was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama in 2012. On March 7th, and this is the picture you're seeing, 1965, John Lewis helped organize the march from Selma to Montgomery across the Edmund Pettus Bridge to the demand voting rights for Blacks. This later became known as Bloody Sunday. The marches were attacked and 50 people were hospitalized. Martin Luther King Jr. led a second march on March 9th to the place of the attack. The marchers knelt and prayed. President Johnson spoke on March 15, 1965, and promised to restore the rights of vote, right to vote for African Americans. On March 21, 1965, the march from Selma to Montgomery was, was, um, was protected by the National Guard, sent by President Lyndon B. Johnson. 25,000 marchers reached Montgomery. Johnson stated, it is really all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice, and we shall overcome. I followed this route last summer and saw the changes in Montgomery due to the Equal Rights Initiative led by Brian Stevenson. The Voting Rights Act passed on August 6, 1965, and was signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson. It was renewed in 1970, 1975, and 1982. The Act outlawed literacy tests and sent federal representatives to monitor voting registration. 
450,000 African Americans registered to vote in 1966. Important sections of the act monitored voting discrimination. Section two, outlawed vote denial based on race or color, later ethnicity. Section three guarantees the rights under the 15th amendment if the court finds a test or device used to deny voting rights because of race or color, it shall be suspended. Section four defines color covered districts as ones that had any type of voting test in place as of November 1st, 1964. And less than 50% turnout in the 1964 presidential election. Preclearance was needed in Alabama, Alaska, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Virginia. In addition, certain political subdivisions, usually counties, in four other states, Arizona, Hawaii, Idaho, and North Carolina, were covered. In 1975, the Act's special provisions were extended for another seven years and broadened to address voting discrimination against members of language minority groups, which were defined as persons of American Indian, Asian American, Alaskan Natives, or Spanish heritage. Section five states that jurisdictions that are singled out for discrimination cannot make changes in their voting laws until the United States Attorney General or United States District Court verified the change did not result in discrimination. Examiners were sent by the federal government. The Supreme Court decision in Shelby versus Holder on June 25th 2013 changed the Voting Rights Act. The decision overturned section four of the Voting Rights Act. The court decided that voting discrimination is no longer a serious problem and is unconstitutional for the federal government to continue to interfere in state elections. Section two prohibits discrimination. The formula in that section, section four, this is a quote, can no longer be used as a basis for subjugating jurisdictions to pre-clearance, leaving the laws again in state hands. Today's you, um, Elizabeth McNamara, president of the League of Women Voters of the United States, reacted to this decision stating, today's US Supreme Court erases fundamental protections against racial discrimination in voting that have been effective for more than 40 years. Congress must act quickly to restore the Voting Rights Act. A clear Voting Rights Act is also needed to assure Native American suffrage. The 14th Amendment defines citizenship, but also has an exclusion clause in the second paragraph. Quote, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction therefore, thereof are citizens of the United States. No state shall make or enforce any law that shall abridge the privileges or immunity of citizens of the United States. Paragraph two, representatives shall be apportioned among several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians, not taxed. That's in the Constitution. American Indian tribes were viewed as sovereign nations. In 1871, the Oregon Federal District Court ruled in McKay versus Campbell that the 14th Amendment did not apply to American Indians because the tribe was an independent 
political community. In 1884, the Supreme Court ruled in Elk versus Wilkins that the 14th Amendment that granted citizenship to all persons born in the United States did not apply to American Indians. John Elk was an American Indian who gave up his tribal affiliation, moved to Omaha, spoke English, paid taxes, and then tried to vote. John Elk claimed he was a resident of the state of Nebraska and was born in the United States and was therefore a citizen under the 14th Amendment and had the right to vote based on the 15th Amendment. Charles Watson, the register of voters, refused to register him because he was an Indian and not entitled to vote. Justice Horace Gray wrote the majority opinion and stated, Elk had not been naturalized as an American citizen. He was born as a subject of an Indian nation that was an alien power. The Dawes Act of 1887 said American Indians could become citizens if they abandoned their tribes and adopted habits of civilized life, which generally was thought to mean become Christian and speak English. The act was a way to free Indian tribal lands for West white settlement. In 1924, the Indian Enfranchisement Act, the Snyder Act, gave all American Indians full citizenship. However, states continued to disenfranchise American Indians by enacting laws that exclude those living on reservations from voting rolls, requiring that they first terminate their relationship with their tribe. It took until 1962 for all 50 states to allow American Indians to vote. The National Congress of, of American Indian launched a campaign in 2004 to register American Indians to vote. The Indigenous Democratic Network was formed in 2005 to encourage American Indians to run for office. The Native American Voting Act was introduced to the House of Representatives on March 12, 2019, to end barriers that still prevented Native American voting. The League of Women Voters of the United States endorsed the act, stating, Native Americans have unequal opportunities to register to vote because of the absence of in-person registration opportunities on the reservations. Election officials do not accept tribal identification cards under strict voter ID laws, or they reject registration applications from Native Americans lacking a physical address. Those who are able to register are confronted by great distances to off-registration voting locations, often placed in sheriff's offices where they do not feel welcome. Our country has made significant progress toward universal suffrage, yet barriers still exist. It is difficult to get a proper voter ID in several states because ID offices have limited hours or are not accessible by public transportation. States are using gerrymandering to intentionally create districts that favor one party. Ex-felons have been granted the right to vote in most states, yet a Supreme Court ruling in July opens the door for states to charge fees and fines before an ex-felon is eligible to vote. We have definitely made strides over time. The poor black woman who could not set foot in the polling place in 1958 could pull the lever in 1972. The Spanish-speaking citizen who failed the English literacy test in 1960 would receive information 
in Spanish in 1980. The 18-year-old soldier who went to Vietnam in 1968 could not vote. They could during the Gulf War. We need to continue to move forward. As President Obama stated in his farewell address, our democracy is threatened whenever we take it for granted, or, or if it, whenever we take it for granted. All of us, regardless of party, should be throwing ourselves in the task of rebuilding our democratic institutions. We should be making it easier, not harder, to vote. Mail-in ballots and early voting makes it easier to vote. COVID-19 has changed the way we vote. New Yorkers vote, New York voters during the primary elections in June had a choice to vote early, mail in their ballots, or vote in person. As the general election approaches, voters are waiting to see if the same choices will be available and if the Postal Service can accommodate a large volume of mail-in ballots. More funding may be needed for the Post Office. It was announced yesterday there would be no cuts in the Post Office before the elections. More voting options encourages more people to vote, moving us closer to the ideal of one person, one vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. That was, that was a wonderful talk. And, um, I think this might be a good time to open things up to questions. Um, while we're waiting for those who want to ask a question to unmute themselves, I just want to remind everyone that if you missed our Monday evening program, Ladies of Liberty, about this very subject, co-sponsored with the League, please go to the library's website and, um, and watch it. So we're ready for questions. Do we see any hands here? I have uh, a question. Okay. Uh, I wanted to discuss a little more, if you could, about President Wilson um, and the march for voting and how opposed he was. It was my understanding that his daughter, Jenny, was a suffragette and that he changed his mind towards the end of his term. And I wondered if you could comment on that. Yes, um, there were many visits by suffragists to President Wilson. And I think you're right about his daughter, Jenny, but he was not listening. Sometimes he just didn't want to hear it. And as time went on, the um, Sentinels were there constantly and there was violence and the, um, the war started. And during the war, they kept on stating of the, about American democracy. So I think that finally, he and his, his family and the suffragists said this should be a war measure. We're fighting for democracy. And he agreed. But it took several years for him to agree. Okay, do we have another question here? Well, there's something in the chat here. Uh, oh, it just says thanks. Oh, oh good, okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, we could take a, um, you know, we could take a moment to see if Susan Wilson is here at this point. Um, by the way, Martha, I have a question. Sure. When, when and how did the term change from suffragette to suffragist? That's a good question, and I don't really know the answer. I think it was always suffragist, and I think we just got to use that term suffragette, and it was considered, you know, a demeaning term. So I don't know exactly when the term changed. Um, maybe somebody in the audience knows, but I don't know the answer. Arlene, do you know? Yes. <laughs> The, okay. you know, in America, we were always called suffragists. In okay. England, they were called suffragettes. And oh, so okay. the press picked that up in the United States, but it was considered demeaning, as you said. So in America, it was always suffragist. Thank but you, Arlene. It, it was literature back then, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, when I was growing up, I mean, we were, 
I think, taught to use the word suffragette, but maybe I'm wrong about that. It just seemed to be in wide use, but I could be wrong. I, I do not know. Anyway, we're, we're glad that it's suffragist now. Did we have another hand raised? I see another question here. It said, didn't Lucretia Mons change her view and give women the vote shortly after meeting you mentioned? Yes, I think she did, but I thought it was interesting at the Declaration of Sentiments that she was against the ninth resolution. Was that the chat you just read yes, here? Yes, I was just reading the chat. Some people I just want to say, it, it looks like um, legislator later Fleming has her hand raised. So oh, yeah. okay. I don't yes. know if that's a mistake. Thank you. Um, Martha, thank you for that uh, piece of education. It's so critically important and uh, really very well done. I appreciate it. I remember many years ago, my mother who worked for the ERA in uh, Richmond, Virginia, she was the head of a democratic club in Alexandria, Virginia, um, gave me a, a little locket of a prison door with Alice Paul's name on it that was <laughs> a replica of the Occoquan prison, which is actually still standing. It became a, a real prison, Lorton prison, and then now is an arts uh, museum, which I hope after COVID we'll all be able to go back to. But thank you for that. What incredible courage uh, those women displayed. And, and um, you know, it's great to be reminded of it. I, I did want to just uh, bring to everyone's attention um, with the election coming up, the Board of Elections has made some changes, as you know, I hope League of Women Voters is doing your normal vigilance because it's such a critical time in our country. Um, but I did want to bring one thing to your attention. We have not yet gotten an executive order from the governor that defines, for instance, whether the Board of Elections will be required to distribute uh, to all voters um, a, an absentee ballot or a no uh, no excuse absentee ballot. Seems unlikely that they will at this point because it's so late in time, but uh, we're still waiting for the governor. But one thing that I has... Think, um, Bridget, I think he said he was going to decide tomorrow on Thursday. I think that's... Funny. I had heard Friday, so yeah, I guess it's okay. true. Yeah. Um, I'm having a discussion. I'm chair of the Ways and Means Committee, and on the 3rd of uh, September, our regular Ways and Means Committee will include a presentation by uh, both Board of Elections commissioners. We're going to have a public discussion, so would love to have League of Women Voters weigh in on what you think is important. Um, it's such a critical time. You know, I think the Board of Elections is doing what they can with limited resources, and at the same time, they've got to get it right. You know, we need to hold them accountable. So I hope that we'll have participation or at least a weigh-in by, by the League. One really important thing that's happened that's of concern, um, I represent Shelter Island among other towns. Shelter Island's early voting location has been eliminated in the new plan. So there's a so-called expansion of early voting sites they were very limited in the primary, uh, but that expansion includes the elimination of Shelter Island's uh, polling site. So I don't know if, it, Martha, is there anything in the law that would allow us to insist upon any particular component of this kind of, you know, I don't know, we're building the airplane while we're flying in it. Is there anything in the law that we could rely on to to say that this is, you know, unacceptable to eliminate Shelter Island's early voting location? Yes. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, Bridget. I wish there was, but I don't know. You know? I suspect so, there's I, not. My research hasn't come up with anything, but it yeah. just seems like an outrageous um, turn yeah. of events, and I'd love to be able to fight it with whatever weapons you can offer. If I can figure something out, I'll be glad to get in touch with you. I really don't know. Martha, I, I, what I'd like to do now, if it's okay with you, is turn to Susan Wilson, because I know some people are going to leave soon. Some okay. people are leaving. We want people to uh, meet the women who, elected uh, representatives who are here. So could we turn that over to Susan now? Okay. Susan, okay. can you unmute yourself? Yes. Or is okay. Carly going to be doing it? Or? Oh, Susan, good. I've unmuted. 
Uh, I'm Susan Wilson, co-president of the League of Women Voters of the Hamptons, Shelter Island, and the North Fork. And you can see that all League members today in celebration of the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote are wearing these gold or yellow sashes which say votes for women. And we've also taken the time to, thanks to Arlene's uh, expertise, uh, to mail them to every elected female official in Suffolk County. Um, we've also recognized uh, 36 of these women at previous online uh, commemorative events. There are just too many names, 45 of you all, uh, to do at one sitting. So we've broken it up in, into groups. So we've already recognized the towns of uh, women in the towns of Shelter Island, East Hampton, South Hole, and the uh, Southampton town villages. Uh, so today, what we'd like to do is we'd like to recognize the additional nine women, bringing that total to 45. And that may not sound like a lot, but that is certainly uh, a big jump from what it had been previously. Uh, if you are here, you've joined us today, um, please uh, un thank you very much for coming. And please unmute yourself when your name is called, raise your hand, and your photo will be shown to the uh, audience. And um, you can say hi to us. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we would like to first uh, recognize in uh, Suffolk County our legislator, uh, Bridget Fleming, in the second legislative district. Hi, thank you so much for everything you do, and thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, Southampton County Family Court, Justice Andrea Schiavone. Hello, yes, yeah, Suffolk County. Thank you for doing this, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for keeping our democracy at the forefront always, no matter whether there's a pandemic, whether um, it seems as if people are just not even that interested in voting, which is hard to imagine, but there are those times it seems to ebb and flow. The League is always there, educating us, letting us get to know the people who are running, encouraging registration, and it is a constant, and, and I am forever grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, in the town of Southampton, we have town council uh, person, Julie Lofsted. We have town receiver of taxes, Teresa Kiernan. The Southampton town clerk, Sunday Shermeyer. Town trustee, Ann Welker. Hi there. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, deeply grateful to the indefatigable spirit of the ladies of the League of Women Voters and also to Rogers Memorial Library, especially you Penny for hosting this today. Um, I have the dubious honor of being um, the first woman on the Southampton Town Board of Trustees since its inception in 1686. So that in itself is a bit of history in this momentous year. Thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you. Um, we have Town Justices Barbara Wilson, Karen Sartain, and Deborah Cooperstein. Hi, I'm Karen Sartain. I'm one of the town justices. I was appointed in January by the town board to take the seat of Judge Giovanni when she moved up to family court. I am running for election for that seat in November, so I am on the ballot. Uh, I'm, you know, it's been an interesting year to be uh, running for an election, and, uh, you know, things like this make it even more worthwhile when you have all of these details about how far we've come. And I really can't thank the League of Women Voters enough for bringing this program to us, for allowing me to introduce myself to many of you who probably, I don't know if we know each other yet. I've been to a few of your debates, but I look forward to um, having more uh, time with all of you. And I really appreciate the time that you put into this program. It was really, really informative and can't thank you enough. Thank, thank you. you. Deborah. Deborah, you, you need Hello. to Hello. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you, Penny. 
and, and for putting this together and the League of Women Voters. I've been a member of the League of Women Voters for over 30 years and still the best, the most informed group uh, of people I've been uh, privileged to be a part of. Um, I was the first woman town justice in, in the town of Southampton and in large part selected because I was very active with the league. At the time, I was the secretary way back in the 90s. And uh, it was a privilege and a pleasure. And it still is. And so good to see all of you today. Thanks for including me. Thank you. The League applauds the dedication and decision you have all made to enter public soft public service. And we thank you for inspiring young women to consider entering a life of public service and becoming elected officials also. Keep in mind that uh, not only does the League educate the public, but we, in we encourage everyone to get involved to whatever degree you can. Democracy is not a spectator sport. We've seen that through, uh, through Martha's talk. Uh, you need to do something, get going, uh, move yourself, and get involved. And uh, one way you can do that is to join the League of Women Voters. Thank you very much to the Rogers Memorial Library. Great program. Um, I want to just, you know, say just a word of thanks as we close this program, Martha. I can't imagine how much work you put into today's very fine talk. Um, thank you from every single one of us. And I also want to mention that for any of you who have friends who weren't able to, you know, come to today's program, this will this recording will be on the library's website. If you have trouble finding it, call one of us. Somebody more knowledgeable than I will help you find it. Uh, <laughs> it'll probably be posted very soon. Martha, thank you again from all of us. So let's raise a hand and hope that you will keep doing what you're doing because you are all, and, and Arlene and the rest of the league, Susan, have been wonderful partners in this program. Thank you all so much. You're welcome. I ran and got my sash because I wasn't only talking about women, so I didn't wear my white shirt, but I figured I should have. I am a member of the league. <laughs> and somebody asked in the chat, how do, you, how do you become a member of the league? Could you be, get, address that? Could you unmute yourself and address that before we go? Oh, Susan, um, Susan um, did you hear the question? Okay, um, I'll answer then. Um, the, you can go to the league's website and there is a membership form on the website. Um, okay, or you could, um, that would probably be the easiest way to do it. Go to the League of Women Voters of the Hampton, Shelter Island, and North Fork website and download a form there. And we'd be glad to have you. Thank you. Um, I, wanna, I also want to thank Yvette. Yvette, let's see your let's see yeah, her. Where are you, Yvette? If it wasn't for her, this wouldn't happen. <laughs> thank Yvette, you. Yvette is the person who like really makes this, you know, with a technology and working through how to do Zoom programs and being here for lots of problems that come up. There is um, someone behind the, the scenes and that happens to be Yvette at this program. She did a lot of work making this happen and helping it run smoothly. So Yvette, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right, are we done here? I think so. I just wanted to say one more thing and then we can go. Um, yeah. Not only people from New York State here, there are people from other parts of the country who I taught with.